I've been kind of playing around with permaculture design for about 15 odd years and I've really found the value of having a process. Now one of the wonderful things about permaculture is that it tends to get us quite excited. Yeah, anyone here excited about permaculture? Yeah? Okay, so we kind of, we go home, we say, must do something! And, um, and many of those things are really good, of course, like planting trees. Here's a group, wonderful group of people that came to do a course with us and they planted some trees. But of course, the danger is that we start putting things in the wrong place. And we come back later and go, oh, I really wish I'd planted that tree somewhere else because it doesn't look very happy there. And now I can see why. So one of my roles, I think, as a permaculture teacher, whatever I am, is to help get us to slow down a little, yeah? to learn the lessons of the slugs and snails who we're seeing a lot of at the moment. So here's a something to avoid. Bill Mollison calls type 1 errors. So this is uh, Ecclesbourne Watch House uh, in Hastings, which uh, when I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, hmm, I live on a quite an unstable coastline and I've been to Lynmouth and I'm looking at that going, hmm. <laughs> anyway, it got washed away um, inevitably because of its placement very close to the sea but at the bottom of that steep valley. So for me, permaculture is about um, not just learning a recipe, because there is no recipe for permaculture. Wherever you are, permaculture is different. It's about becoming a permaculture chef, hence the hat. And that to be able to open anybody's kitchen cupboard, effectively, and be able to create something, a delicious meal from that thing. And, uh, and it's the same whenever we go into social landscapes or onto physical landscapes, that we can start to look around, see what's there, make some judgments about that, and create designs that fit beautifully in that place. And uh, one of our basic rules of effective design is to reduce our inputs over time so we can, we're getting more out, we're putting less in. Yeah? And that comes back to long-term observation. So don't panic, you're already a designer. Whenever you um, make a meal, you're doing a design. It's a design you do very regularly, probably. Um, and so you've probably got pretty good at making lasagna or apple crumble or whatever your perfect meal is that you like to make for people. But that's because you've had lots of goes at it. And the key thing with permaculture is there are some things we do quite often like that, which we're getting pretty good at. And there are some things that we don't do very often, like making gardens or building houses or changing jobs or creating new careers. And so it's good to have a, a process to slow us down and to um, get us thinking through that. And there's some very simple processes um, and they often come back to this action learning cycle which is all about spending time observing, thinking about what we've seen, um, coming up with a strategy or a design and then having a go at it. And the important thing about permaculture is that we implement our ideas because that's when we get feedback from the real world about um, uh, what we're doing, whether it's any good or not. And it's okay to make mistakes because the mistakes that we make are the things that we learn most from. And our schools tend to make us be ashamed of mistakes, but actually we should celebrate them. So. And here's a, one of uh, the frameworks that we might look at. This is survey, analysis, design, implement, maintain. It's the same thing. Survey, observe, analysis, thinking, design, implementation, and so on and so forth. So we've got to get good at observing. And I love this picture because uh, I didn't take it. But I looked afterwards and thought, that's perfect. It looks like a bunch of people um, worshipping a sacrifice. The spear in the back of the neck, can you see that? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, what it, what it is, is the nature awareness course that um, I taught with Mickey here, who's a great nature awareness teacher in Sweden. And uh, this is not to put you off the nature awareness course we're doing in Devon in uh, August. But this is something he calls dog nose, where you just literally get your face down there and actually smell the ground. And of course, uh, Mickey's particularly good at that. He's just right in there. So, but. Um, we've got to get good at understanding patterns. What's going on? Why do rivers behave like this? Why do trees grow in the shapes they do? And that's a really kind of detailed and complex thing that we can go down many levels. So I'm just going to point at it now and move on. And we need to think in systems. So um, we're very good at seeing the individual things. We're very good at seeing the wolves and the elk and the trees and the rivers and so on. We're not so good at seeing the relationships between those things. So in the Elliston Park when they 
exterminated the wolves. They had no idea of the consequences of what would happen, which was basically the elk numbers got really out of hand and they ate all the young trees and the forest started dying because the wolves were gone. So we've got to get good at seeing the bigger picture. And some of these situations create spirals of feedback. So each time you go around, things get worse. The situation gets worse. And eventually, this is one that um, occurs in many parts of the world where growing human population in rural areas leads to deforestation and um, so on and so forth. And then ultimately, people leave. They go to the cities, which is even more unsustainable. So we can identify, we can look at these uh, pictures and then start to look at where we can intervene. How can we turn that around to make it a positive spiral? It's good to think about, um, start to notice these relationships. So in my garden, I noticed uh, the salad that I planted over here was getting quite heavily eaten, whereas the salad that was next to the herbs, this one here, uh, hardly got touched at all. I thought, that's interesting. Maybe nothing to do with it, but it was interesting. So the first thing we need to do is observe the landscape. And this could be in a physical way, like Darren Doherty here with his um, laser level, looking at where the contours are in the landscape and mapping them out. It might be looking at the people that are in the particular social landscape you're looking at and what their skills are and what, um, what their interactions are. With physical maps um, or physical landscapes, or any landscapes, really, it's good to have a map. And the maps we're most familiar with look like this. And we can make use of those maps, existing maps, blow them up using different techniques. And again, I'm not going to get into all the detail of that, but just say that it's, uh, we can, it's good to have skills to make maps, but it's also good to be able to make use of ones that other people have already created. It's making use of an existing resource. Um, there's a few little... DIY mapping tools that we can use in permaculture. Uh, the simplest ones are the A-frame and the bunyip. Anyone used an A-frame or a bunyip? Quite fun, yeah? Yeah. The good thing about the A-frame is that you literally go into a jungle, cut three bits of wood, get a vine, stick a, ro a rock on the end, and you can start working out points of equal level. And I'm not going to describe it here. But uh, it's a very simple tool for finding contour, and contour is very important in permaculture because um, if we're wanting to move water around or hold water in the landscape, we need to know that kind of information. And here's a bunyip water level, which is just basically a hose that you fill with water. And the water is always going to be the same height in the pipes. So as you move the poles up and down the slope, you can see how that water level changes and measure distance differences in height. Or you can get quite technical. Have you got GPS? Anyone got a GPS? I don't. <laughs> I'm a little concerned that when the uh, satellites all get blown out by a solar flare, they won't work very well. But um, who knows? Digital cameras, they're in everything. And particularly if you go and do a survey somewhere other than where you are, just take lots and lots of photographs. Because the things that you don't notice and you don't measure at the time, you can look at sight lines and figure out exactly where exactly was that tree. Oh, it's to the left of that one, if you look from here, and so on. So, And of course, good old measuring tape, although we can even, you know, we have a body that can measure things. You know, people used to do this, didn't they? And use feet, <laughs> pace things around. And uh, once you're familiar with your pacing and uh, what your reach is, for instance, then you can start measuring things with your body. Yeah, and you always carry that around with you. Um, we can locate things using simple maths, or maybe not so simple for some of us, but <laughs> it's... Uh, if you can do this, it's quite handy. I'm not going to explain it now. It would take the rest of the afternoon. Um, yes, the value of photographs can help you identify where things are with sight lines. And then what we want to do is just basically come up with a map. So our base map has the things on that we consider to be fixed. So in this room, it would be the walls and the windows and the doors. And all the chairs, we wouldn't map on the base map because we can move those around. Yeah. So the things that are considered to be fixed are the things that go on your base map. So they can be quite sparse, like this. So here's a field map I made for a, a garden I had. And this is my base map. There's lots of space on it. And that's, what, that's the space in which I'm designing, either inside or outside. So it defines the space, the boundaries. So 
then we want to get out and see what's in that space. What else is going on there? And uh, a nice easy tool to use for this is uh, paste, which is plants, animals, love them or hate them, depending on whether you have nut trees, uh, structures, tools, and events. And it doesn't really matter whether things fit in, whether it's a, is it a structure or a tool, it doesn't matter. The thing is to think about, OK, what plants have we got? What plants and trees? And of course, fungi, which are also really important, and we don't kind of, they're not animals, they're not plants, they fit somewhere in between. So maybe you put a silent F faced, or maybe it's not silent. But um, you can mop up a lot of information quickly by just going out, OK, what structures do we have on the landscape? What events happen here? They might be natural events, they might be events involving people like this one here, where we used to celebrate the different quarters and cross quarters through the year um, to link everyone to the seasons. What's the access onto the site? What, what kind of condition are those accesses in? Is there a bridge coming in? Is it a good bridge or is it a fragile bridge? Um, I've just chosen some funny pictures for some of these. So. Uh, zoning, so what's the, how is the space being used? What different areas are being used? How is the zoning? How good is the zoning? Maybe people are walking a long way. There's a lovely example of a woman called Jyoti who used to be at Tinker's Bubble. And it took her four hours every day to milk the cows. And she, they bought some land, moved to a, um, another place. And she set up the cow shed very close to the house. And now it takes a half an hour a day to milk the cows, simply because of where the cows are. And desire lines. This is from uh, one of my favorite books, Crap Cycle Lanes. Anyone got a copy? It's very good. And uh, you kind of look at that. And at first, you just go, yeah, I've seen plenty of those around. And then you start to think, but where's the fence? <sighs> There's no fence. And, and of course, cyclists just come along and they go, well, I'm not going around. Well, and just go around it. Yeah? And this is the kind of the clues in the landscape that tell you the things that happen, even though you're not there to see them happen, although there is the back wheel of the bicycle. <laughs> Just disappearing off the corner there. Um, and uh, thinking about the energy coming into the site. So this is your wind and your uh, sun and water and so on and so forth. And again, um, I'm not going to get into the fine details of that, but it's just something we need to think about. That a site, we tend to look at a site in isolation rather than the interactions with the site, the, the context, as was mentioned earlier on this morning. So uh, another way that digital photography is really handy is that you can just kind of lean out of your window on a sunny day, different times of year, and just photograph where the shade is. Yeah? And then you can come back in six months' time when you can't remember exactly where it was and just look. And even you know, digital photographs even give you a date on the file. So, and this is uh, where, I, at one point, the place I used to live. And uh, that was the difference between March and November. So November is getting, shadows getting longer into December and then coming back. So this is quite a quick transition across the garden. And this is really useful when you're thinking in the winter, in November or December, where am I going to plant my seeds? Now, when it's wet and windy and cold and snowing and so on, we tend to snuggle up indoors, sit down in front of the telly or whatever. But actually, that's when we can learn most about the landscape. It's where we learn about where the water comes off our gutters and uh, doesn't go where it's supposed to, overflows over here. or um, you know, the snow is melting on the roof here because there's not good insulation and the heat's just melting it from inside the house. This is a fantastic frost pocket at the back of one of the places I teach. And of course, where animals move through the site as well. We, humans leave a lot of evidence of their trace, usually litter and so on and so forth. Animals tend to be a bit more subtle, but uh, they leave tracks and they're much easier to see in the, in the snow. Although, of course, you can go and find them in mud and so on. This is a lovely example of a microclimate. So this is an apricot tree that we put out the back of our house. And this is the very reason that it's there, is <coughs> frost, declining frost, no frost, water butt, thermal mass. This is a lovely example of a thermal camera of a, a bath full of water inside a greenhouse. It just shows you how much warmth that, um, that water holds. Yeah? And that can make all the difference for plants growing around here. So that's a, a nice microclimate, and that's an opportunity to do something. And we can look at microclimates both in terms of um, the climate, the physical weather kind of thing, but also in terms of opportunities to do things around people. Yeah? Maybe the Olympics is a microclimate to do something. I don't know. Yeah? 
Now, in a physical landscape, we also need to think about soil and water. So um, we get out there, look at what's growing on the soil first, look at what's living there, because those things tell us about the soil. But also, it's useful uh, occasionally to dig. Permaculture isn't completely no dig. <laughs> so get in there, see what's going on. And we can use uh, simple methods like the jar test, where you basically put a soil sample in, shake it up, make sure it's um, in fine particles, and then just watch it settle out. And the sand will fall to the bottom very, very quickly. And then over the next half an hour or so, the silt will deposit on top of that. And the clay in the water will suspend maybe even for a couple of weeks or more. And this allows you to just get a sense of proportion of the different mineral fractions in the soil. And this is important in terms of how you interact with the soil and what you can do with it. So um, limiting factors. Limiting factors are an important approach to design. So um, in this case, the key limiting factors, well, there they are over here. Also very good at moving seeds around. You see them, burdock cases. But a friend of mine bought this land. This was all being grazed by these sheep and uh, fenced it off. And within a couple of months, it was already regenerating. And then this is an example of what could happen. So having identified the sheep as a limiting factor, removing them, uh, Chris Dixon here, him and his wife Lynn, bought some land in uh, North Wales. And they identified that there was too much for them to do straight away. So they focused on their main dwelling area, their zone one and two. And they fenced this off. They just took the sheep off. And 15 years later, they have woodland. The seed bank is already in the soil. It, nature wants to succeed to the next level. It's also worth thinking about the different utilities and resources on site. So you can get maps from utility companies. It also can be quite useful for you to get a sense of um, the landscape as well and what's going on. Um, and they're quite keen for you not to dig up their water pipes and their gas mains. So if you suggest you might be doing some digging, you can get yourself a map. And um, things like there's a, a recycling place near where I used to live. So this is a bath that was turned back into a pond or turned into a pond and so on. And a lot of the plants from this garden came from other people who were gifting them. So, um, so with all that information, for myself, I've got my base map and I start putting it on sheets of tracing paper. You could do this on a computer if you're into computing and savvy with that. Um, I kind of like the tracing paper uh, approach. And so for me, uh, with this caravan, I was looking, OK, where's my primary desire line? This is the main farm area. I would come in and out here most often. There's a secondary desire line out to the shed where my bicycle was and a few gardening tools. And if I picked up my bicycle, then the quickest way from there to here was this way. And then I would reverse that when I came back in. And then my zoning is based around the desire lines where I spend most of my time. So my zone one is in this area, zone two around the back, and then the zone three where I give a bit less attention to. And then zone five, well, this shed was a bit wild in places. so. And so it all kind of maps out. So not necessarily circles like you often see on those kind of idealized zoning maps. And of course, we want to find out what the design is about. Um, we design because some human somewhere has a purpose to do something in a particular space. And it might be you um, that has decided you want to do something. Uh, it might be other clients. And other clients can be quite challenging in the sense that it might be that you go into a space and you think something's a good idea, and then they say they want something else, and you're like, ooh. So you have to kind of work with that edge, and it's a, an interesting edge. Um, it's a whole bunch of things you, you might ask them. I'm uh, not going to get into those. And if you've got large groups of people, then you might also look to use particular tools to gather all those ideas that those groups have. So it might be a community, um, like a deliberate community. Or it might literally be a whole community of people, um, like a, a neighborhood or something. And there's a whole bunch of different approaches that you can take here, which are all well documented in other places. Um, and it may well be that if you're involved in that process, it would be good to bring somebody in from the outside. Because to have your own ideas and be a facilitator, the kind of, it's a funny edge that doesn't really go very well together. So we gather all our information in, then we need to start thinking about how do we put that together? And so this is the analysis phase. And I always like to start with what's the key thing that we're trying to achieve here? What's the key function? So 
for instance, in the example of if you decided you need a windbreak, probably because you have a function of maybe food production down here, and you need a windbreak in order to support that process, food production, then we start looking at what different systems can we use to create a windbreak, and then we start looking at the different elements that might go into those things. So we start off with the needs and wants of the clients, so it might be things like food production, and then with, but we're also thinking about what is the, the landscape, what's the land need in order for these things to be done well that supports the land. Okay, so there might be things like stabilizing the soil if you're on a slope, uh, or improving the soil if the soil's poor, or irrigation, or a wind break, for instance, for pollination. So what are the things that can help me with making decisions? And uh, of course, the, the three ethics of permaculture are a good starting point. They're like the tripod. I've gone with four there, haven't I? The tripod <laughs> that um, we can use to just tick some things off. It's like, actually, that's not very... Maybe not that one. And then there's things like footprint. So um, we might think of, hey, I like a straw bale house, but actually the nearest straw bales are like 100 miles away because we don't grow them, don't grow cereals here. Now, the ultimate um, high-impact structure is probably Stonehenge or maybe the pyramids of <laughs> Giza. But, uh, and we, we remember those things, and they're almost like I have this... Uh, so much power that I can create this really high impact thing. And of course, a lot of the, what we see around us here, but London's full of these massive great buildings that are just saying, look, I have the ability to do this. So permaculture is kind of the other way around. And then uh, a bunch of other things, which I won't talk about now, but you come across on permaculture courses and different permaculture books and so on. And then of course, the principles. And uh, the key ones being principles of ecology, so studying nature. Permaculture is all about how does nature do things because nature has been around for a very long time. Life has been around for a long time. And what we see around us in terms of life is the pinnacle of evolution. You know, here we are. It's us and everything we see around us. And so, you know, we can't be all bad. <laughs> and so to study how nature works and the different principles of nature and using those to design what we do. And there's various different fields like biomimicry and so on that have coming forward now as well around those ideas. And then principles of attitude. So um, things like the solution is within the problem is a different way of writing, one that I'm familiar with. And um, this is um, a woman called Colleen Stevenson who makes these beautiful big charts that she draws really big. And she does open space facilitation and records it all. So everybody has their own version of these principles, but it doesn't matter what they are as long as they work for you. So, a few of those principles. So, working with nature, yeah. Life is continuously out there, making more life, yeah. And so, if we just look at the landscape and say, what is it I want to do? What already wants to do this? So, I don't have to do it. Here, a um, lovely friend of ours, Pat, makes use of gravity in irrigating her raised bed system. She basically has water coming down into a stream. She puts it into a pond. Um, and then in the evening, she just opens the bung, in the dam and the water comes down and sits in the garden overnight. And then the next level of this system is she has ducks that come into the garden and because these raised beds, uh, the slugs and snails all come to the surface because they don't want to drown and the ducks go in and they just pick them off. And this is what permaculture is about, is creating these kind of integrated systems where Pat waters this massive great vegetable garden by just basically pulling a bucket out of a bung and operating a sluice gate a couple of times a day. And if you had to do that with a hose or a watering can, it would just take you forever. So catch and store energy. So um, the sun, the ultimate source of power, and that, all of that energy will come through whatever system you're in. It could be you know, your people-based system or your piece of land. Pretty much everything is solar energy. If, if it's rain flow or water flowing through the landscape. That was rain once. That was solar energy stored in clouds, into lakes, in the mountains. And that flows through your side and then goes to the sink somewhere else. It leaves. And as designers, what we're trying to do is look at, well, what nature already does is to capture that energy in the site and store it in something. Store it in ponds or trees or animals, whatever it is. And 
So when we start thinking about how can we do this, we can also cycle some of that energy back and create more storages. So permaculture is about keeping it in the place. And, but knowing that flow is an important part of nature and that there is always flow, but we can create cycles and create more storages. And this is what makes systems resilient. Stacking functions. Yeah, so thinking about all the different things we're trying to achieve. Um, this was a salad I made, which um, ended up becoming a, um, some photographs, which I sold, which was a bit bizarre. And uh, won a permaculture art competition, which won me a jug that leaked, and looks very nice, doesn't <laughs> hold water. Uh, <laughs> I hope that's not like permaculture. It looks very nice, doesn't hold water. No, no, really it isn't. <laughs> so um, looking at the redundancy redundancy is one of those words that we're a bit scared of it's like all oh, that means losing your job but actually um, in nature redundancy is about the fact that there's so many different things all doing the same job that if somebody's not performing so well in a particular year like we don't have many apples on our apple trees but it's okay because you know, okay we've got lots of brambles coming along lots of tayberries and raspberries and so on so in this system, uh, this is Caroline's place at Brookend, which is a straw bale house, and she has solar and wind. Yeah. Usually you've got one of, one of those on the go. Diversity, of course, is very important in nature. And for this Nepali farmer, all of these different beans represent a different opportunity to grow a crop in a particular little microclimate. And uh, over here, this is one of uh, Chris Evans' polyveg systems. And this just makes it really confusing, really difficult for what we call pests, insects, to come along. Our cabbage whites, we haven't seen many of them this year, to come along. And they like to land on a few brassicas before they start laying eggs, because they want to know that there's a food source um, for their caterpillars. And uh, <coughs> kind of land on this one, and then they go looking, and there's all these confusing shapes and smells, and they just go somewhere else. So. And then looking at um, opportunities, so niches. So this is forest gardening systems. This is actually Robert Hart's forest garden. And, uh, and in small spaces as well, we can still make use of stacking. So forest, forest gardens make use of stacking in different layers. And this is um, growing potatoes vertically. Again, thinking vertically, not just horizontally. So then we need to kind of make decisions where things should go. Once we've made some decisions about what we want, where do things go? And this is a little uh, modeling technique I use to help me make decisions about where things could go. Just like write them on little bits of paper. They don't have to look pretty. Um, or you can even just get some stones and um, a stick and draw lines in the dirt. You know, and this is a road and here's some buildings and let's make some decisions. And lots of people can get around that and interact with that model. So... Um, in permaculture, you know, going back to that graph that we had earlier, as inputs decline, outputs increase, we need to think about the best places to put things in the landscape. So this is an obvious place where water starts to slow down. So it's going fast down these slopes, and then as the slope shallows out, that fast-moving water starts to drop the material it's carrying, like soil and seeds and so on. And this is where you start to see considerable veg vegetation. And of course, that continues down this valley. But this is the first place that you get that. And here's an obvious opportunity to put a little dam in and start harvesting water. That's what you need to do. And then you can start irrigating the landscape around using little close contour ditches from that point. Okay. Coming back to the limiting factors, this is McHarg's exclusion method, which um, is about where can't I put something? And then identifying where, so this is me placing apple trees in a fairly exposed Irish Southwest Ireland um, hillside. So lots of wind. This was way too wet down here, frosty, very windy down this side. And I identified this was my little opportunity to put some apple trees, because apple trees generally don't like to be wet. And then this is uh, where all the cold air comes down the hills and just sits there. And so just kind of being aware of those things. Then we want to look at how we, uh, the potential beneficial relationships in the garden. And uh, a simple way of doing this is just to draw a little web, just connect things together. OK, what, what interactions happen regularly between compost and vegetables, for instance, or you know, things you might want to avoid. 
like children with a pond, or maybe that's supervised. So thinking about what these different act activities are. And uh, the ones that basically happen a lot need to be close together. Yeah. This is um, looking at creating cycles around making tea in a more permaculture fashion. And uh, then we want to put it all together so it all makes nice, nice use of what we have. So this is a lovely example that um, Organics, who, Pat, who has the flood garden, has this lovely hot water system. So here's a gutter, feeds into a water butt that gravity feeds into a tank behind here, which is insulated. It's like a giant bunyip. It's got an overflow pipe there. And then that water feeds down into this homemade hot water panel, which heats that up over time. And then you can draw it off at this tap here. And she's got a way of also refilling this if she uses too much hot water. But she makes use of the space she has vertically, because this thermosiphon it has no pump. And in order for this to work, this has to be below that tank which has to be below that feeder tank, and that's got to be below the gutter. Yeah, so it all fits together really nicely. And this here is uh, the original key line system, which uh, Pierre Yeomans created in Australia. And you can see there's a lot of water here for what we might be expecting to see in Australia. And he kept his landscape really <coughs> moist because he managed his water well. So how do we um, create cycles? So going back to those, that little barrel analogy, how do we keep the energy cycling? This is a lovely um, picture, which I'm not going to describe, but that the house and the garden and all the interactions, how things relate to each other. And of course, doing things like composting is a very simple way of keeping that going. And this is a, a tree bog system, which is about composting human manure, but in a way where you don't have to handle it. So, Edge is an important theme in permaculture. It's good to be thinking about the interactions between things that occur at edges. And so um, somebody's made a mandala garden here to minimize paths and maximize beds. And here this uh, kind of strip farming system is looking at the relationship between these crops and these crops and these crops and so on. And that they're close enough together and the strips are narrow enough that you have a, a beneficial relationship occurring there. The way the thing is laid out is thinking about the relationships between things, but also the effective distance of that interaction. So if these plants are interacting by, uh, through the soil, through roots, then they might need to be quite, quite close together. Whereas if the beneficial relationship is to do with pollination, for instance, then those things might actually be quite far apart, relatively speaking. So there are different ways that we already make use of natural patterns. This is uh, a spiral shell turbine shell at the bottom of a hydroelectric plant that basically creates more power as the uh, water is spiraled into the middle. Flow forms modeled on natural, uh, natural streams to oxygenate water. And then this is um, using uh, small particles like gravel to, uh, as a place for bacteria to grow. And these are the bacteria that clean up our sewage. So we might uh, also look at processes and how we put those things together. So this is one that I did around making music. And it helped me identify where to place things in the physical landscape. So I realized I had a lot of ideas when I woke up in the morning. So I kept a dictaphone by my bed, which also was good for recording dreams. And uh, when I went gardening, I put a notebook in my pocket. So if I had ideas, I could just pull it out of my pocket, write it down. And so Putting things into a process helps us also identify where things need to go in a physical sense. So putting it all together, implementation. This is Martin Crawford's forest garden in Dartington. And uh, by implementing designs, that's where we really learn, as I've said before. So we can have very simple plans like this one here, where you just say, OK, in year one, different seasons, we're going to do this. Or you can get into the complexity of things like Gantt charts, where you can basically put things on a timeline and relate them to each other. Um, and certainly if you're doing big projects, this is, this is a pretty good idea. Particularly if, come, if people are coming in to do particular jobs, the, the, you need to know that you're going to be able to do all the things that need to happen first before that person turns up and that they don't turn up and you've got nothing for them to do. <coughs> one of the things we can do with implementation, one of the simplest things is just take away the limiting factors. So I've used this again, haven't I? This is interesting. Um, and this is a, a do-nothing garden, uh, a bucket that I 
found once and I put it outside my back door because I thought it's got a lid, it looks useful. Didn't do anything with it for two years and it grew a garden. So that's my, really proud of that one. Building natural capital. So um, David Holmgren talks about this idea of building natural capital, supporting life in many ways. So here we've got um, nitrogen fixing plants that have these nodules where the rhizobium bacteria live. Um, this is induced stream meandering. There we are. I'm going to say that once. Where the, uh, the idea is to slow the water down because when we create straight channels, water moves more quickly because that straighter channel is more steep. So water moves more quickly. It does more damage. It erodes more and cuts deeper, which makes the, the sides even more defined, which means it travels even more and does even more damage. So the induced stream meandering is to get the stream to get back to where it was before, which is to actually slow down and start to settle out rather than cut. And then this is something that um, is in China where they're actually making these little um, nests almost for plants. This is called net and pan in order to stop erosion and to, uh, as um, water moves through the landscape carrying seeds and material they all go into these little pockets so that the plants actually get everything they need and they grow and they even get some wind protection to start with but here the only thing it's growing at the moment is right at the bottom. And of course um, life continues to grow so we've got to think about everything we put in place is going to need some maintenance and so it's wise to think about putting in the low maintenance stuff first because then you don't have to do much maintenance while you're trying to do everything else whereas if you did the high maintenance stuff first then you're busy keep going back to maintain what you've got um, rather than implementing the next bit okay and there's another lovely design of a toilet and this is there because um, with unfamiliar technologies like compost toilets, it's a good idea to give good instructions. Yeah? So the people know how to look after them, because compost toilets, if you don't look after them well, they can smell. And people don't like smelly toilets. And so if you want people to get excited about these kind of technologies, you need to make sure they know how to use them. And so where's the best place to put the instructions? Well right in front of them for, as you walk in, or maybe on the back of the door when you're sitting down, but zone one. And of course, part of our maintenance is harvesting. Yeah? And uh, one thing we don't do very well at the moment is to weigh, to measure what we're harvesting. So it's useful to kind of keep those records and just see, because that also allows us to look back. I've noticed this year, the growth on our Loganberries in particular is massive compared to last year. So. And for me, one of the most important things is to review how the design's gone. So it might be about the design process, what went well for me for the process, maybe my client interview process, or maybe it's about how well the garden's performing or the people are interacting in the social design. But to reflect on that and to evaluate and to really think about what I learned from that process, what went well, what didn't go so well, what have I learned that will make my next design better? and to celebrate your mistakes. So here's one of my favorite mistakes, which was um, rushing into this design saying, I must make a garden. And uh, my landlady had talked about putting pallets outside the door to make a decking. I thought, that's easy, I'll just put the pallets down and then I'll make the garden around. And then I started thinking about how useful the decking was going to be. And uh, that that's not nearly wide enough <laughs> to put plants on and put seats on. So I ended up, oops, making my decking, my pallet decking, over my garden. But I've learnt a very important lesson about spending more time observing, thinking, not rushing in. And I celebrate that mistake by telling you all now. And uh, this has been quite a, a quick run through, but there's a lot more detail that um, you can pick up on design courses and so on. And um, I put a book together as well. And if you want to have a look at the slideshow, there's a link to it there as well. Okay. And if anyone has any questions, I can't, we're kind of at the time now, but I'm happy to chat to people if you want to afterwards about design stuff. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.